Welcome everybody or welcome back to those who are here for the first in the series. Uh, this is the second in our series of marine and coastal environment indigenous protected and conserved areas webinars. My dogs decided this is the time to move. Um, my name is Beck Borchert. I'm the Marine Protected Areas Coordinator with the KMKNO or the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative. Um, just a quick note about us, we were created to oversee the negotiations and consultation processes between the Mi'kmaq Nova Scotia, the province and the government of Canada. So we're governed and we receive our mandates from the Assembly of Nova Scotia and Mi'kmaq Chiefs and collectively we work on broader nation issues for the Mi'kmaq Nova Scotia. Um, I'll introduce the other partnering organizations as we move forward tonight. So we're working in collaboration with other Mi'kmaq organizations on this webinar. Um, also a partner of ours is Oceans North. They support marine conservation in partnership with indigenous and coastal communities. We are working with UINR, the Unimaki Institute of Natural Resources. They're representing the five Mi'kmaq communities on Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia. And we're informed to ensure the sustainable use and protection of natural resources while maintaining Unimaki Mi'kmaq traditions and worldviews. They have been absolutely instrumental in both the previous series and in this one, so thank you very much to them. We're also working with CMM, the Confederacy of the Mainland Mi'kmaq. It's a nonprofit that works to proactively promote and assist Mi'kmaq community initiatives towards self-determination and the enhancement of community. And they have definitely supported our series in full, so thank you so much to our team for putting us um, in motion on this. Um, as we move forward today, I'll take a minute to just do a few quick housekeeping tidbits. We've had a few changes since our first webinar series. So we'll ask that other than our beautiful presenters, our host Heidi and myself, that you keep your cameras off for the moment. We'll also ask you to keep your microphones off during the presentations. If you have questions or any comments that you want to make before the question and answer period or during, we'll just ask you to use the raise your hand function in the application itself. And our wonderful facilitator Heidi will get to you for the Q&A portion. Um, the presentation has started recording, so we will be recording the presentation portion of this evening, and then we'll be releasing it on the YouTube channel at a later date. We'll make sure to email you guys with all the details for that. Um, please note that the question and answer period at the end of our webinar today is not going to be made public. So we're really hoping for a respectful and an enticing discussion period following the presentations. That was quite a mouthful and the dog has settled. So it seems like a really good time to introduce our Mi'kmaq elder, Albert Marshall, if he is on the line yet. Albert, are you here? I know he registered and I was emailing with his daughter today. So I'm hoping he's here. I'll just give him a minute. Well, not to have bad luck, but maybe we'll move forward and hope he'll join us for closing prayers. So on that note, I'd just like to get started by introducing the beautiful Heidi today. She's gonna to be our facilitator. Dr. Vigand is a researcher and she's a consultant with expertise in health and governance evaluation systems in First Nations public sector organizations and private sector businesses. Heidi's been working with First Nations in the Maritime Provinces since 2006, helping to solve complex issues using her academic and real world experience and an appreciation for the particip participatory approach to problem solving and idea generation. As a professional educator, she's passionate about her work and making a difference with the organizations, communities, and individuals whom she's had the pleasure to cross paths with. Personally, it's been a pleasure to cross paths with her, so I'm happy to hand it over to our facilitator, Heidi. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Beck, and welcome everybody to our session tonight. I'm very excited to hear three different presentations. And uh, what I'm going to be doing is uh, introducing our pre presenters and they'll have a moment to put their slides up and then we're going to um, hear their words will then move into the next presentation and then the third and then open it up for uh, Q&A. You'll may notice that there's no chat box in the, in the, on the side. Um, that is not something uh, that we did intentionally. That is just sort of something that happened tonight because you all know that technology sometimes plays with you. So what we will be doing is asking you to raise your hand if you have anything that you want to add in, but we'll definitely make sure there's lots of time for discussion at the end um, to be able to get all your, your questions and thoughts in. So with that, I'm going to start with Leah McCoy. So I'm just going to do a little introduction. I always say that I'm going to shorten Beck's introduction of myself. And right now I'm going to go and spend the time and do that invite the introduction for Leah. So Leah is a marine conservation biologist in the Marine Planning and Conservation Program at Fisheries and Oceans Canada. In her time at DFO, Leah has worked on areas of interest for Oceans Act Marine Protected Areas designation, the management of established Oceans Act MPAs, and is new to a position focused on 
other effective conservation means and indigenous protected and cons uh, conserved areas. Leah's passion for the ocean started with exploring reef flats in her mother's homeland of Barbados and has continued to grow through her education, personal and professional experiences. At the mention of uh, Barbados, I think all of us are now wondering when we get to go on vacation. At that point, I'm gonna turn it over now to Leah and I'm going to envision where the vacation is gonna be next for me. Thanks Leah, over I, to you. Me too, on this <laughs> negative 30 day, me too. <laughs> um, I am now going to try to share my screen and maybe I'll have uh, Heidi let me know if I was successful. I will, I will. Let's try that. I'm going to try that. Success? Success, you have passed the Zoom test today. I will turn it over to you. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so good evening, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Leah McConney, and I'm really excited to be here and have the opportunity to share a little bit with you about the conservation tools we have at DFO. Um, so just to start us off, I just want to provide a little background context. So while Indigenous-led conservation is not a new concept, the IPCA terminology is, and DFO is working directly with Indigenous peoples across the country as this concept is being advanced. So while we're excited to learn, support, and collaborate with the Mi'kmaq, we do not have all the answers at this point in time. Today's presentation will focus on the spatial conservation tools DFO currently possesses, and will highlight some examples of cooperative management of these types of sites to give a sense of what could happen and has occurred through collaboration in this past. So just want to be very clear that this is in no way to limit what could be achieved um, or what an IPCA could be. I just wanted to start off with a map of the area that I work in. So this map is of the Maritimes region, which contains the Bay of Fundy and the Scotian Shelf. So um, I work, as mentioned, in the Marine Planning and Conservation Group at Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And most of the folks in my group, we work out of the Bedford Institute of Oceanography in Dartmouth. So on the slide, you can see the outline of the area that we work within. Um, and the Government of Canada has made a commitment to conserve 25% of marine and coastal environments by the year 2025 and proceed to try to achieve 30% conservation by the year 2030. Um, so this map shows the sites that we currently have established in our region. So those are the ones outlined in purple. And then the ones that are blue are the ones that are currently in the establishment process. Um, so at DFO, our spatial conservation tools kind of fall into two main groups. There are the Oceans Act MPAs, and then there's the other effective conservation measures, also known as OECMs. So the, our, there are currently 14 Oceans Act MPAs, three of which are in the Maritimes region. And while they all kind of follow the same basic recipe to be created, um, there's quite a lot of variation within the actual end result, the actual final tool in sight. Um, they can be small, they can be large, they can be coastal, they can be offshore. Um, some have different governance structures than others, um, and the activities that are allowed within them vary because they depend on the risks to the conservation priorities for the sites. So that other category, the other effective conservation measures, OECMs, because it's a mouthful, um, these are other spatial conservation tools that contribute towards those targets I mentioned on the last slide. So, those can be things like Fisheries Act Marine Refuges, which are really focused on regulating fishing activity. It can also be biodiversity protection regulations, which I'm just going to touch on very briefly. Um, it can also include ecologically significant areas. So EPRs, biological biodiversity, sorry, <laughs> protection regulations are relatively new with the Scots Island Marine National Wildlife Area, which Carl might touch on, um, on the West Coast being the first site to use them. Um, so like the Fisheries Act Marine Refuges, they really are focused on regulating fishing activity. Um, and then the ESAs, they're another newer tool that's still kind of in the development stage. So they're a regulatory area-based management tool established under the Fisheries Act that applies to freshwater, estuarine, and marine waters. Um, they're designed to provide long-term protection and conservation through regulation. Now, ESAs are a little different because they're not focused on fishing activity, but are more so focused on types of projects that can be allowed and permitted within that area. 
hopping right along because the time is ticket and I got a lot to cover. Um, just a little bit more about Fisheries Act marine refuges. So as mentioned, they are Fisheries Act closures that um, satisfy the other effective measures uh, criteria. So they really are focused on conservation and protection of biodiversity and are really, really trying to hone in on protecting the environment from potential impacts from fishing activity. So in our region, there are six marine refuges and they are really focused primarily um, on cold water corals and sponge areas. So those really sensitive benthic habitat features and in those sites, the bottom contacting fishing gear is, is generally restricted to try to protect those habitats. So Fisheries Act marine refuges can be implemented through both variation orders and license conditions or biodiversity protection regulations. In our region, all of our marine refuges are currently in variation orders and license conditions. On to Oceans Act MPAs. So marine protected areas are parts of the ocean that are legally protected to protect a range of species, habitats, features, um, and others from impacts of a variety of activities. So Oceans Act MPAs can be designated for a number of reasons, including the conservation and protection of commercial and non-commercial fishery resources, endangered or threatened species, unique habitats, areas of high biodiversity or productivity, and for maintaining ecological integrity. So Oceans Act MPA regulations are written a little bit differently than most other regulations are. They start with what we call a general prohibition and then list exceptions. So they are written to start by saying that you're not permitted to do any activity that will disturb, damage, destroy, or remove any living organism or habitat in the MPA. And then they list activities that are allowed despite that general prohibition. So some activities are just allowed. Those are things like an emergency response, activities related to safety and security. Um, those are just permitted to occur. Other activities like research and monitoring and tourism are allowed through an activity approval process. And then other activities, so things like commercial fishing and marine transportation, go through a risk assessment while the site is being designed and, and created. Um, and that process looks at the activities, the conservation priorities for the site, and then decides the risks associated with those activities to the area and what's trying to be conserved and protected. Through that process, activities that are higher risks can be excluded from a site, can be zoned into less sensitive areas, or might have additional management measures put in place. Um, just one thing before I flip to the next slide that I wanna be super clear on, um, it's a common misconception, but an Oceans Act MPA does not mean that fishing is not permitted. Um, all the Oceans Act MPAs in our region permit FSC fishing and commercial fishing is permitted in at least part or parts of the MPAs. Um, I just wanna to touch on the protection standards. So they were announced in 2019 and they prohibit four industrial activities in all new MPAs. And those are oil and gas activities, mining, dumping, and mobile bottom care. So the prohibition on bottom trawling applies to mobile bottom contacting gear used for commercial and recreational purposes. Um, so just to be clear, again, um, FSC and scientific research bottom trawling can be allowed within an MPA where it does not pose a significant risk to the MPA's conservation objectives. Also of note, um, most Ocean Act MPAs have some sort of zoning in place, but it's not a requirement. So generally within the site boundaries, there are different zones which allow different activities. Um, this allows sensitive species or habitats to be protected um, while also supporting socioeconomic activities in other parts of the site. Uh, just one constraint to note when it comes to Ocean Act MPAs is that they are limited to the marine environment. So that means that the regulations only extend landward to the ordinary water level at low tide. So there's, if there's interest in a site with marine, intertidal, and terrestrial components, collaboration will be required. And I have an example of that that I can share with you this evening. Again, a lot to cover in the time permitted, but um, I'm happy to come back to the slide if, it's, if how MPAs are established is of interest to the group. Um, but I just wanted to highlight the fact that consultation and engagement is essential from the very beginning all the way through to the design end designation. Um, creating those 
consultation, advisory, and governance processes are very first things that get taken care of once a site is selected or announced. So those can be things like multi-sectoral advisory committees. Um, they can be specific working groups or bilateral tables for specific groups or topics, um, but making sure that, that interested, affected parties, rights holders, partners, and stakeholders have that opportunity to be involved throughout the whole established part of establishment process is a key component of the Oceans Act MPA process. And just quickly on to some of the fun things that happen once you establish an MPA, um, that advisory committee um, and other governance structures that can be developed through the establishment process are often kept in place once the site is established so that the, the parties that were involved in designing the site still get to be involved in the management. So they can, there's opportunities for involvement in research and monitoring, education and outreach, and reviewing those activity approvals. Um, while a lot of those activities are led through DFO, we do do a lot of partnering um, with Indigenous organizations, environmental, non-governmental organizations, and academia. Um, so there's definitely a lot of opportunities to collaborate and, and work together throughout the management and the life cycle of these sites. Just wanted to quickly share a cooperative management example. So, um, Originally designated a Haida protected area by the Council of the Haida Nation in 1997, for more than a decade now, since the MPA was established in 2008, the Haida Nation and the Government of Canada have been working together to protect the Skonkingless Bowie Seamount under the terms of a Memorandum of Understanding, an MOU, signed by both parties in 2007. The MOU confirms a shared commitment to a relationship based on mutual respect and understanding and facilitates a cooperative approach to the planning and management of the MPA. Under the MOU, a management board was established with representation from two Council of Haida Nation representatives and two DFO representatives. The board, with advisory support from stakeholders, seeks to operate on a consensus basis and submits recommendations to the Council of Haida Nation and the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans for their respective consideration. And one more quick example um, I just wanted to share that I had mentioned at the beginning is the Musquash Estuary MPA. So Musquash Estuary is located in Southwest New Brunswick and was established in 2006. It is the largest ecologically intact estuary in the Bay of Fundy. So because it's an Oceans Act MPA, the boundary of the MPA is defined by water at low tide. Um, but Musquash is unique because it has what is called an administered intertidal area. So through a strong partnership with the government in New Brunswick, certain intertidal areas above that low water mark are also protected and are managed in a similar manner as the rest of the MPA. Additionally, there are a number of organizations that contribute to the conservation of the land that surrounds the estuary, including Ducks Unlimited and the Nature Conservancy of Canada. These organizations are part of the Musquash Estuary Advisory Committee so that the management of these lands align with, align with the management of the estuary. And this patchwork of tools with that advisory committee there to coordinate allows for more effective management of the estuary than would be achieved through just the Oceans Act MPA site. One last plug for our program is, is one other side of our house, which is the Marine Spatial Planning Group. Um, just a consideration that IPCs may occur within or be supported by broader marine spatial planning efforts. Um, so things like improved coordination of management processes, um, improved access and use of information and support for participatory governance and engagement could all help support ICPA development in the future. And just final thoughts before I pass it over to my colleagues is that each of these tools have constraints, but also have flexibility. Um, and we want, just want to emphasize again that an IPCA doesn't necessarily have to fit into one of these holes or one of these tools. Um, it could be an MPA, it could be an OECM, it could be a combination of tools, or it could be complete, something completely different. Um, so thanks so much for letting me share a little bit, and I look forward to seeing what comes up in the question and answer period. Thank you very much, Leah. Much appreciated for your coverage of everything in your presentation. It's going to be very complimentary when we come into Diane and Carell. So I'm just going to move directly into Diane's presentation with an introduction. 
Uh, Diane Blencher has worked for Parks Canada since 2005. In her current position, she is the manager responsible for the establishment of uh, new national marine conservation areas and the marine spatial planning for Parks Canada's NMCA's network. Diane works closely, closely with an amazing team of project managers, marine biologists, communication officers, and GIS specialists to create new NMCA's across the country. She also works closely with Indigenous groups, provincial and territorial governments, and other federal departments. In previous positions, Diane worked as a research assistant in a marine biology research lab in Laval University and as a park interpreter, diver, marine biologist for the Saguenay St. Lawrence Marine Park. The marine world is her passion, and I love the last part here, splish splash into the oceans. If you notice her scarf, she's in theme tonight with lovely fish on it, so don't let that go unnoticed. Diane, we'll turn it over you, to you to share your presentation and, uh, and take us on a journey. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Uh, oh, yeah, I have to start that, start from the beginning. And I'll let you know when they're on the screen. Ah, oh, it should be there. Is it okay? Everybody can see my presentation now? It's not there quite yet. If you want to just okay. see if it's sharing, it's not even in the mode of letting us know it's coming yet. So maybe just check on that sharing. We did it very well in practice. Yeah, I know, but for, for me, it's sharing presently. That's why I, I can start it over. Did you have a chance to share the green button on the bottom part of the Zoom screen to be able to share um, to the group? Sorry about that. Let me look again because now I lost my. Um, uh, this is what we call the te technology gremlins. They hunt yes, around. I'm sorry, I found out that step. So sorry for everybody. Perfect. I'm going back to share. Starting my presentation. Ah, perfect. Now you perfect. should see something. We do. Thank perfect. you very much. So good evening, everybody. I'm happy to, uh, to be here with you tonight to share some of my passion related to the marine world. So, uh, so I'm going to base on instance. So to present can I also be in Canada? Description of a scenario, an example of a so Diane, it's a little choppy there. Maybe we'll just turn your video off. Diane, are you able to hear me? And appreciation of Diane, are you able to hear me? I can't hear a thing. I'm no, sorry. No. I'm just trying to reach. Diane, can you hear me now? I think hers is a little choppy right now. So we'll just check. Diane, can you hear? It's a little choppy. So what we'll do is get you to drop your video. Can you, uh, you can hear me now? that the Park Canada mandates it's to protect. This meeting is being recorded. So I was just mentioning that the Park Canada mandate is to uh, to protect uh, natural and color to, co cultural heritage areas. And it's all of that for the appreciation of our visitors and Canadian. So, and we're trying to ensure that the ecological and the commemorative integrity of our places are protected for present and future generations. So, and if I can give you an overarching uh, presentation of Parks Canada. So we have a network of 174 national historic sites, five national marine conservation areas, uh, 47 national park. We have over 20 million of visitors per year in our different sites. And collectively, we are working with uh, 300 indigenous community across the country. So just a uh, general overview, if you look at all the small dots, it's all the area that Parks Canada are presently managing across the country. 
So I'll get into the National Marine Conservation Area Program. So um, in 2002, we, uh, we created the Canada National Marine Conservation Area Act. And inside of this act, the parliament, when they created this act, gave us very clear instruction and orientation on what we Canada, Parks Canada should be doing. So we are responsible to establish a network of national marine conservation area in, Canada, in all of Canada's oceans and the Great Lakes that are representative of those oceans and the Great Lakes. Uh, we're also ensuring that we are contributing to the international efforts for Canada. And each of our sites needs to be in a sufficient size and configuration to maintain an LT uh, marine ecosystem. And also, so as you saw in our mandate, we are uh, trying to make sure that we can, can connect with all Canadian and all visitors that will are interested in seeing our areas. It also, uh, it's also very important that we consider traditional uh, ecological knowledge, traditional knowledge in the, the way we're planning and managing all our sites. Um, and we are recognizing also that when we create those areas, it's a very fundamental place where it's important for communities and the well-being of the communities that are nearby. It provides also opportunity to, through zoning, to contribute to the ecological sustainable use of the marine area. And we promote the understanding and uh, the research monitoring of those sites also. So when we are creating and we are involved in those uh, um, National Marine Conservation Area, it's important for us that we involve all the federal, provincial, uh, government or agency, uh, indigenous organization or government, uh, coastal communities, uh, and any any bodies on bodies that establish under land claim agreement, and any other person or bodies that are maybe affected by the NDA. And it's also extremely important for us that all Aboriginal rights are respected and that we won't have the project we're doing won't have any impact on the existing or treaty that are presently under development. So things that are important in our, the way we are managing our area, it's uh, it, the purpose of those marine national conservation areas to protect and conserve those area for the benefit and education of people of Canada and the world. And it also need to be managed in a sustainable way so that the ecosystem can still strive in the future, even if we have use inside of those areas. And we are thinking about the future generation also that can also enjoy those marine area as we are enjoying them today. So here you have the, our network of national marine conservation area. So as I was saying earlier, we are looking at creating a network. So we had divided the Great Lakes and the three ocean and 29 marine region. And our objective is to create at least one national marine conservation area per region to represent all those area. So the area you see in blue presently, those are the five active sites we have. And the seven dots you have there it's uh, all the projects that are presently ongoing that have a potential to become national marine conservation areas. So when we think about national marine conservation area, there are some things that are prohibited presently under act that we're not, once they're established, we cannot do. So any exploration or exploitation of hydrocarbon, uh, mineral and aggregate exploitation, uh, and any inorganic matter that is prohibited. So we can still do some fishing, but we cannot explore other type of areas. And also we have the new federal uh, standards on marine protected area from 2019, uh, where we will have some other prohibition that will be added. One of them presently, it's no bottom trawling in those areas. So 
in each uh, NMCAs, do we have we need at least two type of zones. We need to have a general use area, as I was mentioning earlier, where we can have ecological sustainable use, and we need to have uh, areas for higher level of protection. So where we, we would be protecting sensitive areas, and where sometimes also we would be uh, conserving or protecting uh, cultural aspects also that are important. Under our act, the Minister uh, of Fishery and Oceans and Transport Canada maintain their regulatory authorities. So, but they still need to apply their uh, authorities under the, uh, the, the NMCA Act, so the National Marine Conservation Area Act. So, so, so when I was talking about the uh, fishery notion, so the permitting and everything is still uh, related to fishery notion. And it's looking at everything related to fishing, aquaculture, fishery management. And it's the same for Transport Canada where everything related to uh, marine navigation and marine safety is underneath the Transport Canada. So Parks Canada would sign agreements between uh, Fishery Notion and Transport Canada and Parks Canada to make sure those are sustained as we are managing the, the new NMCA. So here I'm presenting a little bit the NMCA establishment process. So we it's like a five step uh, process. So the first, uh, first step is when we're identifying a, a representative marine area. As I was mentioning earlier, we have 29 marine region and we're trying to identify in each of those region the best representative area, so where we could have a national marine conservation area in the future. So this is done with the literature review. We're looking at all the existing data presently where we, we think we can find the best area. We, we try to identify between three and five. And out of those three and five, we would select what we think it would be the best one. So that's the step two where we select an area. And at this point in time, we will start to talk also with the, with different groups, indigenous government group, uh, different province or territories to see if they have also an interest in creating this. Sometimes also this step, we have some people that are approaching us to, to do some national marine conservation areas in their regions or province. And sometimes we, we are looking at the proposal to see if it's overlap with some of the area interests we have. The determination of the feasibility, it's one everybody agree that we should try to evaluate the feasibility of creating a national marine conservation area in a, a certain region. This is the big step where we have all the consultation process. We would have intensive consultation to determine at the end of the process if it's feasible to create a national marine conservation area and if the response is yes, under which conditions. If ever we would have received a no, we would go back to the first step and try to select a new site. And after that, once we have everybody decide that it's feasible, we would sign a, an agreement and return to cabinet for to get some operational funding. So for each of the, the sites we are creating, we are developing a infrastructure, uh, like some things like visitor centers we have we manage from the sites all our different uh, national marine conservation area. And we will enter after that into negotiations. It could be with the province, with different indigenous group of government, depending on with whom we are working. And we need to, to create an MCAs, we need to own the land. So sometimes we have transfer of land. So we are able to create the national marine conservation area we can have portion of the terrestrial aspect, the uh, intertidal zone and the sea bottom and all the column of water, depending on what's the best and geographically aspect that could uh, meet the, the, the NMC protection. After that, it's the signature of the establishment of the agreement. Starting that point, the site is starting to be operational. And after that, we'll be working our way to uh, 
put the new description of this National Marine Conservation Area under the, uh, the Act. So uh, I was asked to give you two uh, um, examples of indigenous protection and conservation area in Parks Canada. So I'm going to give you the first one I'm going to give you. Oh, I lost my, oh, my Texas. Sorry for that. I think you, it put the slideshow. Sorry. Um, I'm going to give you a terrestrial uh, example. Um, so when the, the two examples I'm going to present to you are co-designation. So we have indigenous the government that decided to use their own law to design an indigenous protected areas. And they approach us and we work with them to, they wanted to protect their, their sites from preventing certain type of use. And we applied the case here of Titan NNA, we applied the National Park Act on top of it to protect it as a national park preserve. And like that, they were able to uh, to protect their area. So for the Thai Dene, they, they started by uh, designing this area under the Lutze K Dene First Nation in 2019. And it was protected under the Dene law. And after that, they, we, we created a management plan where we were working with the DNA, the indigenous group, the federal government, the territorial government to protect everything. And so after that, Parks Canada did create a, a portion of this big area as a national park reserve. So I'm going to show you, um, just to give you an idea. Oh, it's not me. Sorry for that. So this is the uh, the general area here we have. So in the what you see in orange is what was protected uh, by the as an indigenous protected area, it's their uh, their territories. And as part of this section, we have for the a green area here, where this portion was protected with the the Parks Canada Act, the National Marine, uh, National, uh, sorry, the National Park Act here to create a national park area. And the pink area here is a territorial uh, park. So, but as a global area, all of it is managed all together as one unity. My next example is uh, with Guayana's uh, Park Reserve. National Marine Conservation Areas and the Ida Heritage Site. So in 1987, 85, sorry, the Ida Nation designed the, the southern part of Ida Gwai as an Ida Heritage Site. Um, and since uh, 1993, the Ida Guayanas have been corporately managing the Ida Nation and Parks Canada via the Archipelago Management Board. In 2010, they, they used the Parks Canada National Marine Conservation Area Act to be able to protect part of the water around the island. And also part of the land is protected under the National Park Act. And since then, the Ida Nation, Parks Canada, and Fisheries Ocean have been working together with the Archipelago Management Board to making decision on the land and the sea to, to protect them as best as we can. So here it's the, uh, just to give you an idea of the area that is currently protected in the, the Pacific Ocean. So that's the end of my presentation. So I will be pleased to answer to any of your questions uh, later on. Great. Thank you very much, Diane. Much appreciated. And we navigated a few of those little technology things. We're going to now uh, move over to Corel as our third presenter. So Corel, I'll just do a quick in, uh, in, uh, introduction. And if you want, you can go ahead and try to put your slides up. I say try, optimal word. 
So Dr. Corral Allard is uh, the Canadian Wildlife Service lead on design and establishment of marine protected areas and conservation networks in Atlantic Canada. And then it took over my screen for a moment there. Um, um, joining, um, so in, that's in Atlantic Canada, and he's joining the Marine Migratory Bird and Ecosystem Science to protected area implementation and monitoring. He has been involved in advancing efforts to conserve 25% of terrestrial and marine areas by 2025. So that's a goal of 30% by 2030 using inclusive partnerships. Corel is an impassioned nature enthusiast on land and at sea and strives to impart this passion on his children and those around him. His perspectives on conservation have been enhanced through experiences, notably with Inuit in Canada's north, and most recently through enlightening conversations in Mi'kma'ki. I will turn it over to you now, Corral. And uh, if you want, I'll just double check your presentation and make sure you want we have that viewing. It's perfect now. We don't have we have a little makeshift that we're doing, folks, tonight in terms of Corral. So it's not going to be a full screen. It's going to be like this. Oh, Corral, go ahead. Is that okay? Okay. I'm, I'm, I hope that uh, the message gets across. That's the important thing. So thank you all, uh, Gwe, and I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, with you all tonight. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of the Canadian Wildlife Service of Environment Climate Change Canada. My talk is entitled Dovetailing Contributions to Marine Protection, because as we've seen, some of the more compelling uh, examples of, of protection involve multiple instruments to achieve uh, a vision um, for ecosystem uh, protection that we that we desire. I'll be talking about my migratory bird sanctuaries, national wildlife areas and marine national wildlife areas. Who we are? Well, we're the Canadian Wildlife Service and and our our main mandate is the is the conservation protection of migratory bird species at risk and their habitats. And and my role as a protected areas coordinator is on that final point, um, the, the, the habitats for species at risk in migratory birds. Um, we're undergoing a, a significant expansion. We're doubling our capacity on, within our protected area unit here in Atlantic region. And we're certainly um, significantly enhancing our capacity on the marine side going to, uh, to six staff here in Atlantic region. And why is that? Well, we just mentioned the ambitious targets of 25% by 2025. And, and 30% uh, by 2030. There's also a broader recognition of the breadth, breadth of responsibilities we have, uh, role and opportunities uh, for habitat protection um, for migratory birds in Atlantic, in Atlantic Canada. We all know that Atlantic region is, is more marine than it is terrestrial, and that should be reflected in, in our business. Um, so that will be reflected in what I will be sharing tonight. So what we do, um, you have heard, you know, a, a good, you know, wonderful examples of, of, of the implementation of, of measures on the ground, on the landscape. What we, for um, many, many years, have been working to inform those efforts and, and add to the picture, complete the picture, uh, bringing in information on migratory birds and a migratory, the needs of migratory birds and species at risk. Um, we have done so also in with regards to indigenous protected and conserved areas. I'm thinking of Adagia National Wildlife Area in uh, Northwest Territories, but also in terms of informing prov pr provincial protections and other effective conser conservation measures. We undertake site level implementation and that includes establishing new sites. And that's very much the case here in Atlantic Canada. I'll bring to you, I'll share some examples here shortly. Um, we are indeed developing cooperative management with Indigenous partners here in Atlantic. Um, we are engaged in monitoring new and existing sites, not only our own, but those of our partners. Uh, we also have uh, an opportunity to connect Canadians to nature, and we do so at a few of our, uh, within a few of our sites. We are, of course, given the reality of climate change and dynamic coastlines, compelled to advance protections that span the marine terrestrial divide. That divide is largely anthropogenic. That means humans created that divide. Ecosystems don't necessarily adhere to that distinction. Um, so we are interested in advancing uh, adjacent terrestrial protections that limit pressures on marine areas. Um, we uh, acknowledge the fact that marine birds that are marine organisms use islands on which to breed and places um, where they can uh, lay their eggs and rear their young. 
um, but still while making use of important adjacent foraging areas. We're certainly looking toward a future um, for, to ensure the viability of salt marsh here in Atlantic Canada for future generations and for the benefit of our ecosystems. Some of the tools that we have used historically include migratory bird sanctuaries designated under the Migratory Bird Convention Act. Seven of our 15 areas here in Atlantic have a marine component. So we've already contributed to a degree to protecting aspects of the marine environment through these uh, tools. Examples are listed there. One of our migratory bird sanctuaries in Newfoundland is entirely marine and it's adjacent uh, to a Terranova National Park. A good example there of, um, of uh, 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 complementary designations. However, we don't foresee any new migratory bird des uh, sanctuary designations in the Atlantic region. We have other tools that we're going to be focusing, focusing uh, in on a little bit more. But we still think that there's a future. There may, in fact, be a better future for some of our Atlantic migratory bird sanctuaries. In terms of national wildlife areas, you may be familiar with some of them. Some, seven of the 11 Atlantic national wildlife areas are adjacent to marine areas. They're not marine per se, although some of them contain upland salt marsh areas that are important as well. They're in that transition between the terrestrial and the marine. Um, those, those national wildlife areas are uh, designated using the wildlife area regulations that apply on public lands that are under the administration control of our minister. Um, and that's an important distinction. We have three new national wildlife area islands that are in progress. St. Paul Island, Il Oat, and Country Island, all in Nova Scotia. We have a new national wildlife area that consists of multiple islands and head headlands that we are envisioning that is presently in progress uh, that um, will be called the Atlantic Archipelago or something to that effect. And um, we also have a new national wildlife area with a marine component this time that is in progress. And this is Big Place Bay Lake now, uh, in Nova Scotia and Cape Breton. It, it presently is a migratory bird site designation, but because the lands are under the uh, the, the, the estuary itself is under the administration and control of our minister. It can be designated as a national wildlife area that protects the marine environment. So just some pretty pictures to share with you. This is St. Paul Island, significant to many of us dating back millennia. Um, also in Oat in the inner bay of Fundy, also of uh, tremendous significance and beauty, um, appreciated um, by few because it's so remote um, but there may be opportunities for, for many more to enjoy its pristine uh, beauty for, for generations to come. Uh, Country Island off the coast of Nova Scotia, a very important uh, seabird breeding site for many, multiple species, also of, uh, of great significance. And here is an aerial uh, photo of Big Lace Bay Lake that shows the estuary itself. The, the dune uh, bar or the barrier system, barrier beach system on which piping plover, for example, nests. Many staging waterfowl use this area. In terms of our enhanced marine commitments that come with this you know, new staff and new capacity, um, come um, some issues with timing. Well, we have resources that are in place now to start uh, doing this work, um, getting to work on, on these files. Um, we have added staff capacity that, uh, that, that the staff that are expected to join us in, in early uh, this year of 2022. Our overall approach, however, and, and it's been the case for, for, for many years, is to enable partnerships and to foster and engage integrated um, in initiatives, um, specifically to limit land-based pressures on marine ecosystems. And, and there are good examples of these, and I won't get into too many details. Um, we also are interested in advancing the conservation of marine birds and their habitats through federal, indigenous, and pr provincial efforts. So we work closely with our partners uh, to advance our own mandate. Um, and we are uniquely positioned now to, to contribute directly to integrated participatory marine-focused initiatives. We have three sites that we're interested in. No surprises, these are uh, globally recognized for their importance to migratory birds. Cape St. Mary's in Newfoundland, Whitless Bay, Newfoundland, and of course the Inner Bay of Fundy that many of you are well familiar with in terms of massive flocks of migrating shorebirds, waterfowl, geese, etc. The Inner Bay of Fundy initiative 
um, was spawned um, in part through work that was being conducted within the Sicknick district, uh, the Shignecto Isthmus uh, community nominated priority place. The Shignecto Isthmus is, is an important connector here in, in the Maritimes. We acknowledge the importance of the adjacent marine areas, but we recognize that we needed to assemble a different group of uh, a, a different expertise to uh, examine the, the values, the pressures, um, and the strategies that can be used to ensure the long-term viability of the Inner Bay of Fundy and everything that it contains. So the steps that we took and are taking are continuing within the Inner Bay of Fundy uh, consisted of, of starting from, from the outset in bringing people together for a shared conversation to ensure that we could achieve shared understanding. We identified a team, we set a scope, um, we developed a vision, what we want to see, what we want to realize. We identified targets, the things that we care about in the Inner Bay of Fundy. We assessed generally the health of those targets and set or and identified indicators associated with that health. And then our and now we're in the process of setting goals. What do we want to achieve? What is the health level we want to see for the future? We identified and ranked pressures or threats, and we've started to um, undertake the, 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 you know, the more challenging work of identifying the key strategies that, we, that could be implemented to address these pressures. So when I say strategies, strategies can include protected areas, a strategy in the form of a protected area can go a long way toward addressing multiple pressures, multiple threats. All of this will benefit from the fact that folks were involved from the outset. And, and so when we get to the, the point of selecting an instrument, we are all on the same page. We have a, a general shared understanding, shared vision. We know what we want to achieve and we're just, um, that, that we simply need to identify the tools to get us there. Um, I wanted to, to, to close out the, 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 the suite of protected area tools that we have at our disposal with the Marine National Wildlife Area designation. It is a fairly new um, designation that we have under the, the, the Canada Wildlife Act. It is different than the national wildlife areas that I mentioned previously. We have only one example in Canada, um, and that is the Scott Islands um, uh, a marine national wildlife area in off the coast of, of Vancouver Island in British Columbia. It constitutes an example. It's not a template. And the regulations that accompany the, uh, national, the marine national wildlife area can be tailored to fit the needs uh, to, to achieve the vision that is desired. In the case of the Scott Islands, this involved the, the, the creation of a very simple mosaic uh, the islands themselves were already protected. They're, they're globally recognized for their importance for many bird species. However, we recognized that the, the, the breeding habitat is not enough. Access to a productive marine waters in which to forage, to find food, is as important as a place to lay eggs and rear young. So we needed to work with the province of British Columbia, and we have been working closely with our partners at, at Fisheries and Oceans Canada to apply the biodiversity protection regulations to support the, um, the achievement of the vision that we have for the Scott Islands Marine National Wildlife Area. So the idea is working together, we can overcome jurisdictional constraints. Some of them are jurisdictional, legal in nature. Others are simply anthropogenic because we see divides where there are none. We, um, together, we can achieve more appropriate ecological scaled protections. We can stre strengthen connectivity, connecting breeding sites to migration stopover sites to wintering sites. We can enhance climate change resilience in Atlantic Canada. We can look, look forward to two meters of sea level rise over the next 100 years or so. Our coastlines will change. Our protected areas with coastlines will change as well. We can, we can build in uh, better resilience to things like sea level rise and, and climate change through, through working together. So in summary, we have resources in place to enable these ground up decision support processes. And we have resources and capacity in place to implement new protection measures. Um, our protection toolkit 
includes two enabling acts. I did mention the Migratory Bird Convention Act and our migratory bird sanctuaries that perform an important role. Um, but I wanted to shift attention to the Canada Wildlife Act because it contains many more tools at our disposal, some that are yet unused, um, but can, that, that could be explored. Certainly in the national wildlife areas, we, we have them. They're, they're scattered on, on the Maritimes landscape. But this potential for a marine national wildlife area also exists that we could envision here for some of our for some some of these sites. But um, as others, um, as Lee and Dian both suggested that 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 protection tools should be used, you know, to to realize as opposed to constrain a vision. So the the importance of of having a clear vision what what we want to achieve then uh, brings the, the question of how, of how do we get there and which tools are, are best used or which suite of tools, which complementary measures can be used to achieve the, the desired vision. So I put the question, you know, the question to you, can, may we envision protection mosaics that constitute IPCAs? Could we an, envision the use of complementary supporting or enabling measures? And Last question, which tools might help realize your IPCA vision? And here I was careful to suggest that that tool could be pluralized um, as many tools could be used to uh, realize the vision that you're hoping to achieve. With that, Walalin, and, um, and I look forward to discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karel. We're going to now move into a piece where we're going to have an opportunity to have some dialogue amongst everybody. I'm going to actually turn the recording off at this point and say thank you very much to Leah and to Diane and Karel for your presentations.